Hello, everyone. This is Robbie Miller, Executive Director at AXIS, and welcome to the second in our series of webinars that, that will continue throughout 2018. We're glad you could join us here tonight. And we are really uh, thrilled to have a, a very special speaker here, uh, and she'll uh, begin her presentation in just a moment, Corey Nori. Uh, is the spe featured speaker. She is a transition social work coordinator at Niemers uh, Hospital with a master's degree in social service and law and social policy. She specializes in transitions from adolescence to adulthood and is experienced with children who have X and Y chromosome variations. Uh, she's going to discuss how to start the transition process and when is the best time to start it. And, and in Corey's own words, it's earlier than you think. Uh, on your screen, uh, you should have an opportunity there to type in questions. Feel free to type in your questions, though we will probably not begin to answer those questions until the conclusion of her formal presentation in about 45 minutes. And I will then be reading the questions to Corey and she will be answering them. So Corey, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And I'm gonna hand this over to you. All right, well, thank you everyone. I'm so fortunate to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so like Robbie said, I am Corey Nori. You can laugh at my name, it's okay. Um, and I actually am unique in that I get to support young adults with all kinds of pediatric onset conditions as they move from the pediatric world to the adult world. Um, so tonight I'm going to focus my time with you on talking about the different domains of transition. And um, the reason I pick these domains in particular is because of all the young adults I work with, um, I'm tr I'm, my goal is to be able to answer the questions and give you guidance towards um, looking for services in your area um, for what people do the 363 days a year that they're not spending time at their doctor's office actually. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with this PowerPoint. At the end of the PowerPoint is also my email address. And so if there are specific questions um, afterwards that are more personal or you just have you know, a great idea in the middle of the night, feel free to send me an email anytime. I answer questions from people all over the world around different aspects of transition. And if I actually don't know the actual answer, I will get you the answer. Um, so please reach out to me and feel free to do that and share this with other people. So just to kind of lay the groundwork, um, and again, with a, such a wide audience of people on the phone or on the webinar, um, it's so great because we have some people with very young children and some adults who are impacted um, and everyone in between. So in the way that I think about this transition in particular, um, we think about kids being served in the pediatric system um, where you're used to kind of a certain level of care and type of care over the years, and then eventually that moves to the adult world where it looks very different. And so this slide probably isn't too shocking to you if you are an adult because you've lived through this before. Um, but in pediatrics, you know, by nature, we're family-centered, developmentally oriented, um, focusing on wellness. So we're having those routine clinic appointments going from, you know, birth to the six-week appointment to the two-month appointment to the six, six months and one year and two year. And all those in-between appointments were getting kids from being very, very tiny babies into full-grown adults. Um, and the discussions in those clinic uh, appointments is not only medically, how are you doing, but how are you growing? How are you developing? What are you doing? How are you spending your time? And all of these things that are very kind of, maybe feel more warm and fuzzy. Um, and then people move to the adult world where now the expectation is that that young adult is now capable of managing all of their stuff themselves. And they're supposed to know everything. There's an expectation of autonomy for that patient to be the one in charge of everything. Um, and also the adult world really is expecting progressive decline of medical conditions, and it's really disease oriented. So it's less focused on the wellness and hey, how is everything going versus more of what's wrong today and how can we potentially fix it? Um, so those are very two very different systems. And what we find is a lot of times people aren't prepared for that abrupt change in the way the service is delivered. Um, so we try to talk about these things of transition and getting people ready and having transition be a process and not the administrative event. Um, so trans, transition is not transfer of care, For transfer of care is one day you see a pediatrician and the next day you see an adult doctor. The transition should be this therapeutic guided process where you're kind of learning steps along the way with the goal being eventually you're able to manage these things on your own to the best of your ability. So with that being said, um, let's look at that. It should be a guided therapeutic process. 
we really want with transition, there should be no surprises. Um, and so that's the idea that no matter if you're even already seeing, let's say, a family medicine doctor, where you're not actually going to change physicians, we still want there to be a transition in the way that they're approaching you as a young adult, um, a way for you to start to learn your own medical stuff and be able to manage things on your own. Um, and so this, this really should be an ongoing event. Um, and like Robbie said, you know, what's the magic age? I get asked that all the time. When should transitions start happening? Um, and actually, the literature around healthcare transition says kind of glibly that transition discussions should start at diagnosis, which probably seems a little weird at first, especially if you're diagnosed with a, you know, as a baby or an infant. Um, but the reality is we want people to be thinking about the future and looking down the road and saying, okay, if my goal is for my child to be as independent as possible and go to college and move out, what do I need to do in those you know, next 10 years to get them ready for that? Um, so really, the whole idea is wherever you are is the right time to start the transition preparation. And we're going to talk about some of the strategies and tools later on tonight um, that I use and with young adults I support um, to try to encourage them to find ways to get more involved and to know their stuff. Um, and I meet plenty of people who are 25 who said, I've never done any of this before. I'm so late to the game. And I'm like, you're fine. Where you are right now, just start from this point on, and we're going to keep building those skills. So... That was my entire medical spiel. <laughs> um, now I'm going to spend the time talking about the different aspects of transition domains um, and what people need to know. And from all the families I've worked with here at the hospital now um, for seven years in the clinical setting um, and my career prior to that in supporting young adults with intellectual disabilities, these are usually the questions that people have that they don't know where to go to ask um, or kind of guidance. So my goal for tonight is to talk about the wide range of services available to people um, and there may be some of you on the webinar who it does not apply to based on your own medical issues, or you might have somebody else in your family who says, oh, you, you say this person is better suited in the situation. So I'll try to be relatively broad about things, um, but know that, again, you can always email me with more specific questions about an actual service in your area, and I'm happy to help facilitate that. So for every young adult I work with, one of my questions is, Right now, who do you live with? And typically, teenagers or young adults are living at home with parents, typically. And then I say, oh, what's your plan for the future? Are you going to live at home with mom and dad forever? And that's always a funny question because sometimes the answer comes out before I even finish the question because they're so sure they're moving out. Um, and other people say, no, my plan is to live at home forever with my parents and vice versa. So just to give you a sense of things, there's a continuum of residential supports out there for people with um, special health care needs and pediatric onset conditions, ranging from living at home with their natural family supports to more um, residential programs. And those would be different levels of care, supporting people who may need some help um, with living, independent living skills, uh, who might need help with activities of daily living, might need help with things like medication management, um, you know, people who have a hard time with executive functioning and kind of understanding time and, you know, time management, who might need somebody, whether it's a paid caregiver or, you know, a volunteer person to help them kind of make their way through the world. So just as you can see on the slide, the continuum really goes in this situation from what we call the most restrictive environment down to the least restrictive. Um, so the most restrictive would be like a facility-based institutional level of care. In the adult world, uh, one of the big differences is that there aren't really very many facility-based options that is not a nursing home. So I work with a lot of young adults where parents might have concerns about their child's ability to live independently, and their parents may be interested in them living in a residential program um, that might have more intense nursing needs, let's say, in some situations. That program typically really looks more like a nursing home in the adult world. And in a nursing home, the average age is obviously higher um, it's not typically, you know, 21, 22-year-olds. So um, the next level would be something like a group home, which would be 24-7 supports um, with staff people, and typically between up to five young adults living together. Um, typically, group homes are set up to be sex segregated, um, and then sometimes they try to have people with similar medical conditions or developmental disabilities living um, together as well. And then there's obviously things like independent living. So there's different types of independent living. So someone living by themselves completely, somebody living with roommates or family members. Um, some people will live independently, but then have a staff person who comes in maybe once in the morning and once at night to make sure they took their medication or something like that. So there's all kinds of levels of support that can be out there for independent living skills. Um, the most important thing would be to understand their wait list for these services in the adult world. Um, and this is the part that people usually are shocked by. So for the typical group home, 
it's about a 10 year wait list to get into one. Um, and this is a national issue. It's not a thing, it's only a Delaware issue. Um, it's national and that's because people are now surviving into adulthood at unprecedented rates, which is great. Um, and people also are living longer. And so we don't have um, resources allocated yet appropriately to be able to support people living in residential supports um, like a group home um, without there being wait lists right now. So I could talk to you about you know, your individual state if you've got questions about this, but this would be somebody who qualifies more from the intellectual developmental disability kind of side of things, um, which again, with XY variation, you kind of have a whole gamut of, uh, of young adults we're talking about here. So if that's your child or that's you, um, my recommendation would be to make sure you're registered with your developmental disability agency in your state. Um, the names change a little bit from state to state, but it's probably got intellectual disability or developmental disability somewhere in the title for it. Um, and if you, you know, call those people and get registered with them, you could talk about plans for residential supports and programming as well. The next area I talk about is around education. So um, a lot of young adults I've worked with who have XY variations um, have an IEP, an Individualized Education Plan or Program. Um, and the federal law says that by the age of 14, every IEP should have a transition plan as part of it. Um, my experience tells me that most IEPs at 14 or 15 or 16 years of age don't really have a transition plan in place yet. It just says we'll talk about transition next year and then we'll talk about transition next year and suddenly it's someone's 18 or 19 and people are like, oh man, we talk about transition. Um, so I would really encourage you if you're in that young adult age range right now and you haven't had a chance during an IEP meeting to really talk about transition and start the discussions, I would encourage you to think about bringing that up and saying, let's just talk about what the vision, what my vision is for the future, what kind of careers I'm interested in and what my goals are um, and having that be documented. And ideally, we actually want young adults to be leading their IEP meetings as much as possible. Um, and I know it's probably pretty boring to sit there in the meeting once a year with a whole bunch of people around the table. But one of my friends I used to work with um, had an IEP and he would say, he would use the analogy that the IEP meeting is kind of like a birthday party. And you wouldn't skip out on your own birthday party because everyone's there for you. The same way that for your IEP meeting, the I is you as the individual. And it's so important for you to be there sharing your perspective and having people get to hear from you and learn from you differently than they may have otherwise experienced. So I really encourage young adults to be active in their IEP meetings. And I could talk about some suggestions for that as well. If someone has an IEP in school and they're still working on their IEP goals, under federal law, they're allowed to stay in school until the year they turn 21. And that does not mean they have to stay in the same high school program. It means that they can stay within the Department of Ed from their school, to, from their state. So we have some young adults who, if the IEP goal is to work on independent living skills and um, maybe some executive functioning skills for college management, where they actually sometimes will actually go to college and have college paid for it by the Department of Ed while they're up until their age of 21 as part of their IEP goals. Um, so it's an important thing to know about. And um, if you've got questions, again, I can answer them offline. There are this um, center that's on this website here, on this page here. Um, there are different resources out there for educational advocates to help families navigate this issue of transition. Um, and trying to prepare for the future. So this is a great link to finding the place based on your state for educational advocates who can help you with arbitration or mediation or, um, you know, we have families where they have to threaten a lawsuit or have a lawsuit to have the school district actually pay for something um, that they, their child is entitled to under federal law. Um, if a young adult is interested in going to college, um, I would definitely encourage you to be registered with your Office of Vocational Rehabilitation in your state. So Voc Rehab um, works with people um, who have what are called barriers to employment. And the idea of that is if you have XY variation that causes you to have some um, challenges, let's say, with staying on task or um, executive functioning type things, you might have a hard time keeping and maintaining a job, getting a job and keeping that job. Um, so places like the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation in your state might have things like a job coach or some accommodations they can offer to you to help you become employable and keep your employment status positive. Um, also, another reason to think about Voc Rehab is that they sometimes will pay for college for young adults with disabilities. So if your barrier to employment is that you need a college degree to get that job, then sometimes they'll pay for those college um, classes as well. Um, one of the biggest differences between an IEP and being in the traditional public school system and moving to college 
is that you're entitled to those public those uh, accommodations under IEP. In the college world, it's based on eligibility for services, not entitlement. And that's a huge difference. And sometimes the eligibility for these things seems completely so random and weird um, that it's just people are used to kind of having accommodations in place because they've always had them. And then when you get to college, there's actually, um, you have the burden of proof of the disability status and the need for accommodations falls on that young adult, which sometimes it's really hard to manage yourself because you've always had a parent or somebody who's there guiding you along the way. Um, and now suddenly the expectation is that you are the one who's supposed to show up at the Office of Disability Supports and disclose a diagnosis. And if you tell them X, Y variation, no one's going to have any idea what that means, right? Um, so you have to be able to go in and explain to somebody, this is how I learned and how I was successful through high school, and this is what I'm going to need in college to be successful as well, whether that's something like having, you know, extra time on tests or extension on projects or a quiet room to take a test, all those different kinds of accommodations, it's up to you as a young adult to go in and disclose that to the disability office and to get those accommodations in place. Um, and we've had some colleges I've worked with over the years where um, the colleges were super accommodating and other colleges where I swear that they were doing everything in their power to make it harder for that young adult student. Um, so just be prepared that sometimes you really have to do the squeaky wheel to make sure you're getting the accommodations that you need and bringing in documentation from healthcare providers or, you know, testing and those kinds of things as well. Another thing is if you're a college student and you're going to be living away from your parents' home maybe, um, one of the biggest differences is that, you know, in college you have a totally different schedule, um, you're in charge of things now, you're living in a dorm or an apartment or something, and um, different kinds of medication. One of the sad realities of the world we live in is that sometimes medications that people take for, let's say, like attention issues, um, sometimes they have a street value. And so in a college setting, we want people to make sure they're protecting themselves and their medication so that way it's not something that could get stolen from you because it's probably something that would actually help you be successful in college. So we come up with strategies and ways to do that as well. Um, FERPA is a law that says that even if your parents are paying for college, um, that your college experience, your college transcripts, everything that goes on in college is private to you as a student. And so sometimes that's a hard pill for parents to swallow, to understand that they don't, they can't call in to the college professor and say, but you know, he had a really bad day last yesterday. He needs help in this situation. Um, they don't actually, the idea is you're an adult now and you need to figure out how to navigate it yourself. Thinkcollege.net is a great website that lists tons of colleges around the country that are actually designed for students with different types of disabilities. So they have some college programs on there that are traditional four-year colleges, some college programs that are a two-year certificate program, um, some colleges that are known to be more accommodating in certain areas. So this is a great website to use and find out what colleges are in your area or if you want to move on the other side of the country, what's available to you that way. A really, really, really good resource. Um, if someone's not going to go to college, we talk about, you know, what they're planning to do once they're done high school, and this is typically employment. Um, so, again, a continuum of services ranging from adult day programs, which would be kind of like your um, adult daycare. So, it's not any focus on um, career training or anything like that, but it's really people are kind of doing social recreational activities all throughout the day. Um, then there's programs that are um, what we call sheltered workshop environments where people with disabilities are getting paid a piece rate basis to do certain jobs. Um, and then we have things like um, supportive employment and competitive employment, with the idea being that somebody is earning a competitive wage just like their peer next to them. Um, and even in competitive employment, there might be job coaches who are there helping you along the way, helping you get used to the requirements for the job or to, um, you know, troubleshoot, okay, you know, if you're having a hard time coming back from your lunch break, how can you make sure that this happens so that way you're not clocking in late or something like that? Um, and again, like I said earlier, the college experience is a traditional college. There's a ton of options out there. And one of the things that I think is really important to understand for young adults is just because you think you want to do something at 18 or 19 or 20 or 25 doesn't mean you have to be doing the same thing at 40 or 45 or 50. You're allowed to change your mind. And I think sometimes in the disability world, we get so pigeonholed into thinking that like we need to have an answer right now for someone and that what you choose at 21, you're stuck in. And that's really not true. The goal is that you're doing something that's meaningful to you and you're allowed to change your mind. So if you're not ready for college at 21, that's not to say that 25 or 31, you're not ready to try college at that point. So don't, I would just say don't sell yourself short and think you're stuck in that situation. Um, insurance financial matters. So this is something that um, 
for anybody who is alive in today's world um, is something that every day there's a new situation going on that we had to stay on top of as far as insurance goes. Um, but just some very basic things. Um, if you are a young adult or on your CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance Program for your state, that ends on your 19th birthday. Um, and then there's kind of different options that exist. And again, it's really variable depending on who you are and what state you're in. But um, for young adults who have intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, um, a chronic medical issue that's going to impact their ability to be gainfully employed, let's say. Um, as Once they turn 18, they can apply for SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income. And the definition for SSI as an adult is essentially, is this person capable of gainful employment more than 20 hours a week? And if the answer is no, they're not, then that person would qualify for SSI if they meet the financial threshold, which means that the person cannot have more than $2,000 in assets in their name. Um, and that's like stocks, bonds, savings accounts, anything in their name would count against their assets. And so in order to get SSI as an adult, you need to, again, not, need, not to be able to work more than 20 hours a week competitively, essentially, and then also not have more than $2,000. In most states right now, if you're an adult over the age of 18 getting SSI, most states also means that you are eligible for Medicaid from your state. Um, they're typically linked together, although not every single state's that way. Um, but again, with the variation right now going on in insurance and insurance reauthorization, those kinds of things, what I say today, I cannot guarantee is going to be true as of January 1st or April 1st or anything. So just take it and understand that we really need to pay attention to the insurance discussions that are going on in the world. Um, sometimes I work with young adults where their parents are like, yeah, they, we applied for SSI when they were younger and we got denied, so it's not worth it. Once that young adult turns 18 and becomes legally an adult, the parents can be millionaires. And that young adult, if they still meet that criteria as far as not having $2,000 in their name and not being able to work more than 20 hours a week, that young adult can actually get SSI, even if parents have a ton of money. Um, they're looking only at that young adult's um, assets at that time, not the family income. So we have some people where they didn't qualify under 18, but then by their own individual account at 18, they qualify for SSI and Medicaid. So it's just an important thing to know. Um, and then one of the downfalls of SSI in Medicaid eligibility is you have to keep your assets under $2,000. So if you're trying to plan for your future and you're thinking, well, yes, right now I can't work more than 20 hours a week because of a variety of reasons, but I want to eventually be able to save up to move out or to have a, you know, a, a inter more interesting life and a family and that kind of stuff, then it's important to think about doing um, estate planning. And this is actually, I know actually on your AXIS site, um, you had a webinar, I think, from the people in Georgia, I'm pretty sure, that I think is linked on your website actually around um, estate planning and special needs planning. So that's something, a resource I would definitely suggest you look at as well. Um, but the idea of estate planning would be for parents typically to help plan for their young adult's future for when the parents are no longer here, both from a financial standpoint, but also maybe a support standpoint. So um, if you want, let's say as a parent, want to leave your adult disabled child life insurance policies, right? So you have a life insurance policy for yourself that says when you die, you want your child to inherit you know, X amount of dollars. If it's more than $2,000, when you die, you, your child would inherit that, and then they would get kicked off of SSI and Medicaid. So instead, what could happen is you can create a special needs trust, and this is done by an estate attorney or an elder law attorney, and I could help connect you to them if you don't know somebody. Um, but that attorney can draft a special needs trust for you. And so what you would actually do is instead of the beneficiary of your life insurance policy being your son, instead it would be the special needs trust of your son. And the money, you could leave millions of dollars from a, a life insurance policy to that special needs trust, and your child would still be eligible for SSI and Medicaid um, because it's protected. So um, in a special needs trust, you can leave retirement accounts, real estate, life insurance policies, stocks, bonds, savings accounts, any resources you want, you can leave into a special needs trust. Um, and then the executor of the trust is usually either a bank or you, would, you could appoint an individual person. And the money from a special needs trust is supposed to pay for anything that SSI is not paying for. So SSI is supposed to be paying for your very basic needs like food, clothing, shelter each month. 
Um, and actually, in 2018, the SSI maximum payment is going up to $750 a month. So right now, it's at $736 a month. Um, so January 1st will be $750 a month, which isn't probably enough money for most people to live on, depending on where you live in the country independently. Um, so we have some young adults who are getting SSI and using that $750, but then they also have a special needs trust that's helping supplement some of their expenses that SSI is not able to pay for. Um, another option would be to consider an ABLE account, and this is something that is like a 529 college savings plan, but for somebody with a disability. Um, an ABLE account is different from a special needs trust in that an ABLE account actually has a, an annual um, limit as far as your contribution goes and a lifetime limit before it impacts your SSI eligibility. So this is also something that a special needs estate planner and um, attorney could talk to you about the options between an ABLE account versus a special needs trust. But it's something that I think a lot of families don't know anything about and sometimes parents get um, told, like, don't leave your child any money. And the reality is that we don't want that to happen because it's not that you don't want to leave your child any money, you want to make sure it's protected so that way they're still remaining eligible for government benefits like SSI and Medicaid if they're eligible for it. Um, so I can talk to you more about that as well um, offline if there are specific questions around it. Um, so like I just mentioned with the insurance thing, it's a big unknown right now. Right now under the Affordable Care Act, um, if you as a young adult have insurance through your parents, you can keep that insurance until the year you turn 26. Um, and then sometimes commercial insurances will have what's called an adult disabled child clause, which says if you have a, a disability or pediatric onset condition um, that's permanent, that you can keep your parents' insurance indefinitely. But the actual insurance companies that have those clauses is completely um, random. So usually what I say is, assuming that we keep the ACA mandate until 26, um, but usually around 24, 25, I'd say it can't hurt to call the insurance company and say, hey, do you have an adult disabled child clause? You know, would an XY variation count in that clause? Um, just so you would know that if you have that extra coverage or not. Um, and so right now with the discussion of healthcare reform and things changing, um, you know, with XY variations, there be, prior to the Affordable Care Act, um, insurance companies could deny people for coverage based on pre-existing conditions or they could charge more money for pre-existing conditions and all kinds of stuff. So I would just tell people to pay attention to what actually um, comes as a potential health um, insurance reform and actually what gets voted on. Um, we don't want people to lose coverage uh, because the plans that have been discussed in the past at least would say that as long as you've maintained coverage, you can't get um, penalized, let's say, by having a pre-existing condition. But if you lose coverage, then potentially an insurance company could say, well, yes, and you have this condition, so we're going to charge you more money because of it. Um, but it's really super tricky, and um, I just don't feel people to pay attention to it. Because most young adults, if you ask them anything about insurance, they have no idea. <laughs> They've never heard of it. They don't know anything about it. They give the paper to the parents, and that's what they do. Um, so that, giving the paper to the parents, actually leads to the discussion of legal status. And so this is one of the areas that I think most people in pediatrics don't pay attention to because um, it's just not something that we really think about very often. But legally, when someone turns 18, um, the, with a few exceptions, there are actually a couple of states that 18 is not the age majority, but the vast majority of the country, 18 is the age majority. Um, and the expectation is that someone on their 18th birthday is now magically able to make all of their own decisions and be successful and manage everything on their own. Um, they can sign legally binding documents, um, and HIPAA takes effect for 18-year-olds. So for most 18-year-olds, it doesn't matter what their medical condition is, most of them are not super ready and capable on their 18th birthday to manage everything about themselves. They still have parents or some other adult caregiver in their life who is helping them out. Um, so one of the things I want people to know about is um, I want you to find out in your state if you have what's called a health surrogacy law. And so um, a health surrogacy law state says that if someone's over the age of 18 and in the moment the person doesn't have the capacity to make a decision, because of an intellectual disability, because they're unconscious, because they're confused, they're so sick. Whatever the reason is, if two attending physicians say, this person doesn't understand this right now, a health surrogacy law state says their next of kin automatically makes decisions for them around medical issues. Um, and the next of kin hierarchy is typically a spouse, followed by an adult child, followed by a parent. So if you're a health surrogacy law state, like Delaware is, and someone turns 18, and they haven't done any formal documents as far as legal status goes, and the person comes to us in a situation and the person doesn't have the ability to make the decision or can't communicate the, the decision, doesn't understand what's going on, 
then the law says the next of kin would be the person who we talk to about the situation. So this is a passive thing that just happens automatically for people um, if that's your state law. And so any kind of formal legal document overrides the health surrogacy law. So the way that a formal document would be, there's two different options to consider. One would be a healthcare power of attorney. And so this is something that would say that a person over the age of 18 or 18 and older can sign that says they're giving certain people permission to be what's called their health care agent, which says that they're giving them permission to talk to their doctors on their behalf, to access their medical records or notes on their behalf, and then to help make decisions for them if in the moment they don't have the capacity to make the decision themselves, or they don't understand something. So a health care power of attorney doesn't take away someone's rights. So it's not a guardianship, it's very different. I'll talk about that as an option. But a healthcare power of attorney says, yes, I'm an 18 year old, I'm 19 year old, I'm 40 years old, whatever the age is, and I'm telling you that this is who I trust in a situation, I, they can talk to my doctors, they can get my notes or records if they need to, and this is who I trust if I don't understand something for, to be my person who, yep, I trust them to make the decision for me, or if in the moment I can't make a decision, I trust this person to make a decision for me. Um, Healthcare power of attorney documentation is actually available in every state as part of an advanced health directive, um, which you could Google your state and it will come up for you. Um, it does not require an attorney. It requires either um, the document to be signed in front of a notary or witnessed by two people who are not part of the healthcare team. Um, and so for most young adults I work with, especially for people with XY variation, um, I think a healthcare power of attorney is probably a valid, legit thing to do in that it's saying the person retains their rights, but also that this is somebody, these are the people who I trust to help me out and understand these things for myself. It's a living document, which means that it can be time limited, revoked, edited at any time. Um, so the way I usually frame it for young adults is like, right, you start out by probably having your parents down as your healthcare agents. But eventually, if you decide to get married someday, you can write void on that one healthcare power of attorney print out a new copy and put your spouse as your first person and then your parents or whatever. But anytime you change it, you wanna make sure you give a new copy to all the healthcare providers, including the insurance company, so they know who it's okay to talk to. Because a lot of times I find the insurance companies, you know, are people who don't know you face-to-face -face, <clears throat> and um, they might have somebody on the phone who says, well, we can't tell you anything. You know, someone says over 18, we need their permission first. And if you have sent in the power of attorney, then they go, oh, look, we have it on our file that it's okay to talk to you as a parent. Um, you know, let me help you in this area. So um, it's completely, you know, a valid document. Um, like I said, every state has one. Usually states would honor other states by just say, like, if you live in Delaware and you're going to move to Colorado, when you move to Colorado, just Google healthcare power return to Colorado and print it out and do another one, um, just so that way you have the ones valid for that state. So that's healthcare power attorney. Person retains their own rights, um, doesn't take away their rights. It's a, it's a, um, support document that says, yep, ask me the questions, I'll do it to the best of my ability, and if I don't understand it or I'm not good at this answer, um, I'm telling you my parents or my people I've listed here are the ones who I trust to help me make decisions around this topic. Only for healthcare things, not a financial power attorney. Financial power attorney requires an attorney actually to draft it. Um, so the other option would be legal guardianship. And so legal guardianship is granted by the court system. And it means that the person has a legal determination of incompetence to make decisions for themselves, which means their legal rights are removed and given to the petitioner who is typically a parent. Um, so guardianship in the grand scheme of all the options is what we consider the most restrictive thing in that it's re removing someone's legal rights and giving them to someone else. Um, Guardians make decisions for the person. So it means the person that um, they're making decisions about where the person lives, how they spend their time, any medical issues, all those kinds of things. The guardian is the one who's making the decision, not the person with the disability themselves. Um, in my experience, I don't know anybody who's ever petitioned for a guardianship where it was not granted. Even when in my mind, when I know the person, I think there's no reason this person needs a guardian. I think that they have the ability to help to have some supported decision-making supports or be able to use the power of attorney. Um, it's extremely difficult to reverse. Unless you, so in the state of Delaware, you can't reverse a guardianship unless you can prove a miraculous recovery. So I know when I spoke actually in Colorado, the uh, conference was this summer, there were some parents in the audience who were like, hold on a minute, I have guardianship and I was told I can, I can give it up whenever I want to. So it depends on each state. So I would just say to caution you to look into your state's guardianship laws 
um, and to fully understand what you are committing to as the guardian. Um, we have some people where they've done a guardianship, <coughs> excuse me, um, because somebody in the school told them you need to get a guardianship or else you're going to get closed out of your child's life and never have access to anything anymore. And they did it because they thought they were doing what they had to do. And then they have it and they're like, oh my gosh, I don't want this. It's not what I needed and I can't get rid of it now because it's a legal determination of incompetence. Um, so, and it costs money. So we've had families um, spend $14,000 to do a guardianship. Um, and in many states, you can actually file for a guardianship yourself without a private attorney. And the fees are drastically um, less than $14,000 at that point. So if you've got questions, I can help facilitate offline as well around that. Um, but I would start, my personal philosophy is to assume competence of people. And so I would probably start with something like a healthcare power of attorney first. And then if necessary for a variety of reasons potentially, then maybe if necessary, then pursue a guardianship. There's nothing that says on your 18th birthday you have to run out and get guardianship of your adult child. Um, if, if you're at 45, it may become necessary for some reason. Um, although what I find is if your state is a surrogacy law state, then guardianship is probably unnecessary because if the person doesn't have the capacity to make the decision, then the surrogacy law says their next of kin automatically makes it for them, which would be what the guardianship would do for you as well. So it's a little bit tricky um, and super complicated, um, but something that I want people to know about because I think that people get a lot of um, kind of misinformation and they get driven towards making a decision that's a big, major big deal, not knowing what the other options are around it. Um, so now I'm going to lead into the discussion around self-management, and this is something that um, a lot of young adults I work with, you know, they're trying to, they're, the whole like I, idea of adulting and taking care of themselves is like not super exciting to them. And sometimes I say it's actually harder for the parents to let go of some of those responsibilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so like I said earlier, when's the right time? <coughs> right now is. Whatever, whatever age you're at, now is the right time to start this. <coughs> Sorry, now that I'm talking for an hour, my voice is going to go. All right, so <clears throat> what I find in clinic is if you've been going to the doctor your entire life as a child, there's a high likelihood that in the clinic setting, the doctors have talked to your parents the entire time <clears throat> and not to you. You've been sitting there, maybe you had your iPhone out, you were listening to your earbuds or whatever, and they haven't really been engaging you in the discussion. And then you make the move to the adult world and now suddenly your parents may not be with you in the exam room, or <clears throat> people start asking you questions, you're like, what are you talking about? I have no idea. Because what happens is that you actually need to be learning the skills, and it doesn't just happen through osmosis. So just because you're in the room doesn't mean that like it's sinking into your brain and you've had a chance to practice it. So instead, we want to be very, very prescriptive about what we're doing to help support young adults becoming more independent and managing their lives. <coughs> so I always ask this question that sometimes grosses people out which is how do you eat an elephant? Have you ever heard this expression? The answer is one bite at a time. Because I think otherwise people can get very overwhelmed by the idea of self-management and getting more independent. And you're kind of like, I don't even know where to start. So you don't start anywhere. And that's what I'm saying is you have to pick one bite at a time and say, okay, I'm going to start in this one area. Starting today, I'm going to start doing these things myself and then building up the skill over time. So the areas I want young adults to develop um, are areas around personal care, uh, medication management, and then healthcare things. And I'll give you some examples of these things. So um, a lot of young adults I work with, especially with XY variations, <coughs> man, sorry, who maybe um, have some um, symptoms that look similar to like an autism spectrum disorder, or maybe had a diagnosis as well, sometimes need some extra supports or <coughs> assistive technology. And so what I'm going to show you are all types of assistive technology and options that exist today that are actually available in your state to try out for free um, through assistive technology resource centers, which I'll give you a link to in a second. So this is just an example of some of the different variety of things that exist in the world. So this is a gripper um, for people who are vertically challenged or use a wheelchair to be able to turn on the um, stove, the knobs in the back of a stove, so to reach that. This is a food chopper that um, you know, people who have a hard time maybe with like the fine motor skills of using a knife and cutting up food. Parents are worried about them stabbing themselves or cutting themselves. <clears throat> a food chopper is a great way to be able to participate in things like preparing your own food um, and not have to worry about the danger part of it. Um, this is a hard um, 
container that you can stick a carton in. And so for a lot of people, a, a carton in general is really a weird thing to hold. Um, it's very awkward for most people. And so this is actually something that you could stick a carton in and then you, there's a handle on it that you could pour out of, or actually they make one that um, has a little fulcrum point that you could just tip it and it would pour out for you. Um, this next one is the one that everyone's gonna love. Um, so this is a spatula that you squeeze the handle on and it flips, it rotates it right over for you. Um, so even if you don't have any reason you need this in your life, you're gonna say, oh, I want that in my life because that just makes my life so much easier to let it flip my pancake that way, or my grilled cheese and not have to worry about it going all over the place. Um, and then the next one is actually, before I show it to you, is something that for a lot of young adults I work with and parents, when you're thinking about you know, your child and wanting them to be independent and successful as an adult, um, one of the areas that I find um, people lack experience in is this next one. And so the best predictor of whether a person is going to be gainfully employed as an adult, which I think most parents, their goal in life is for their child to be eventually gainfully employed. The best predictor for whether they're going to be gainfully employed is actually if their parents made them do chores. <clears throat> And so even for a young adult who, let's say, has a physical disability, there are ways for that young adult child to be giving, to be contributing to the household by doing chores or something like that. So this example that you guys see on the screen is um, a forearm crutches, dustpan, and broom. But when I work with someone, my goal is for them to realize, like, oh, no, I actually have skills and talents that can contribute and be meaningful for my family. Um, and it may look different than somebody else, but it's important for me to be doing these things and learning how to do these things myself. Um, and sometimes I phrase it to the young adults, like to think about it like, right, so I want you to be able to take care of yourself. So that way, eventually, you can also help take care of your parents, too. So there's all kinds of tools and, and tricks out there to help people be more independent. Um, so like I said, there every state has assistive technology resource centers. And this is actually, these are places that allow you to try out different types of assistive technology for free, to take it home, try it out for a few weeks to see if it works for you. Because I'm sure you guys have all at some point bought something you saw on TV or at a store and you're like, this is going to be life changing. And you get it home and you're like, well, that didn't work for me. And that's a major bummer. So if you're somebody who has tried to get assistive technology and get like your insurance company to pay for it or something like that, and then you take it home and it doesn't work, it's even more frustrating. So the idea of the AT Resource Centers is they have all kinds of equipment for independent living, for educational things, so like, um, you know, voice output. Um, system so that way you can speak into a microphone and it'll type up the paper for you. Um, all kinds of note-taking tools and, and different ed educational accommodations. Um, things for bathing independently. All kinds of stuff that you could actually take home and try out to see if it works for you. And then if it does, then the people at the AT Resource Centers can tell you, okay, like this gets paid for by insurance or this is actually available at Walmart in aisle 14. Um, so they know all, they're awesome people full of knowledge and resources about all kinds of things to help people live as independently as possible, um, as long as possible. So um, on the website, on the screen you see right now is the link to the um, different state programs. Um, really, really, really good things. And I tell people to check back into those resource centers all the time because there's new stuff being created on a daily basis. Um, and again, you look back on, you're like, how did I ever live without this thing? Um, so there's all kinds of really cool things out there. Another thing um, we want people to know is kind of why they take, not kind of, is why they take their medications. And so um, a lot of young adults, again, it's something that parents maybe have just done for them every morning, giving it to them, and it's easy. The routine is just, you know, I hand, put up my hand, I get the medicine in it, I pop it back in my mouth, my glass of water, and I'm out the door. Um, it's really important for young adults, for kids at any age, to know what they're taking, why they're taking it, what happens if they don't take it, any side effects, and who prescribes it. Um, and then for that young adult to be taking their medicines independently to the best of their abilities. <clears throat> um, and we have plenty of young adults who go away to college where all they know is they took a yellow pill and they have no idea what it is um, or what it's for. And so we actually work on that in our clinic to come up with like, okay, this is what we need to talk about so you can start to answer these questions yourself and know how to manage this. Um, so to encourage that, um, there are tons of different apps out there for medication reminders. Um, most young adults are attached to a cell phone it's been my experience at least. Um, <clears throat> and so there's all kinds of free apps out there that could send text reminders or can buzz in your pocket to remind you to take a medicine. Um, or, you know, you can, we tell people sometimes even just set a timer on their um, alarm clock and then 
to just keep hitting snooze until they actually take their medicine so that way it keeps buzzing in their pocket every five minutes or whatever. But sometimes um, people need more reminders than that or other ways. So we have things like pill boxes. So this is, you know, a relatively basic kind, which is just Sunday through Saturday, morning and afternoon or morning and evening things that you could have your medicines in. Um, this is one that you can actually put in your pocket that has a timer built into it. So it's got eight different sections there and you could have your medicines with you and, you know, the alarm would go off in your pocket. You take your medicine at 12 noon and then the alarm goes off at two o'clock again. You take those medicines. So that's another option. This is a kind of monthly um, pillbox system that you could fill up ahead of time. <clears throat> um, other things, this is a timer cap. Um, and the reason this is, I think, so cool, also not just for people with XY variation, but um, if you have any parents who are aging um, or elderly who maybe have some issues with memory, um, or maybe for yourself, because that's something that we all deal with, I think. Um, so this is a cap that tells you how long it's been since the bottle was last opened. So if you're supposed to be taking one medicine a day, you may not, not need a pillbox system, because that might be just be too much work for you. But if you have something like timer cap, and you look at the, the bottle lid, and it says it's been 26 hours since you took your medicine, you know that you didn't get your medicine yesterday, actually. Um, so that's a nice resource for some people. Um, this is something that um, a lot of young adults will say, like, oh, you know what, I, I forget my medicine every morning because I'm running out to the bus or I'm running out to get to my car to go to school or whatever. Um, and this is actually, so you can see it's from Walgreens, um, it's a pill case for your um, cell phone jack. So, you know, it, can, it, it plugs into your phone and you could have, you know, depending on what your medicine is, um, a couple pills in there. And that way, if you're on the bus in the morning, you're like, oh, I forgot my medicine. Oh, I can take it right now or when I got to class or whatever. Um, so that's like $2.99 at Walgreens. Um, and then this is something that doesn't look so great on screen maybe, but this is pill pack. So this is a, um, it's actually a robot that do it, um, prescription system where they actually will mail you a month's supply of your medications in these individually sealed little plastic bags. So that one there says Monday 8 a.m. And it would have all your 8 a.m. meds in that one little pack together, which is really great for transportability. So if you're going to school or to work and you have, you know, medicine at noon and three, you could just grab your noon and three packs with you and put them in your pocket um, and then take them at those times. Um, so obviously the pill pack thing doesn't work, you know, with like an inhaler or something like that. Um, but for something that someone's on, on routine chronic medicines like this, um, it's a really a nice feature because it's easy. You could also look at it and say, oh, my gosh, it is now, you know, nine o'clock on the East Coast and I, my 8 p.m. meds are still there. It means I didn't take them tonight. Um, so that's another resource that people find useful. Another thing we went into is sometimes <clears throat> teenagers, shockingly, think their parents are nagging them to remind them to take their medicine every day. So one of the things I talk about is to just make a very easy calendar for yourself. Um, and the goal is that once you take your medicine as a young adult, that you know on that date you put a check mark or a smiley face or whatever, and then that's like the calendar that's in the kitchen, on the kitchen counter, on the refrigerator, and that way your parents can walk by and they'll look at the date, and if they see the check mark or the smiley face, they're not allowed to say anything to you about your medicine because they know you've already taken it. But if they walk by and they see there's not a check mark on there, then that is an open invitation from you as a young adult to have your parents remind you to say, hey, did you take your medicine? And you may be like, oh, yeah, I totally did. I just forgot to check it off. Um, so it's a way to kind of take out some of that control and power dynamic and, and empower that young adult to be more responsible. We have some young adults I work with where they're living away in college in the dorm and a mom is calling them every morning to remind them to take their medicine. And so instead, we come up with like a, a, a strategy where, you know, they might just text their mom the thumbs up every morning. And that way she knows they took their medi her, his medicine or, you know, vice versa. Um, <clears throat> so just ways to kind of take away some of that power dynamic and that struggle, but encourage a young adult to be as independent as possible. Obviously, that situation, it only works if you're actually taking your medicine. So if there's issues with noncompliance, that's a totally different topic. Um, but once someone gets kind of into routine habit of this, this would be a good way to kind of take out some of that um, nagging feeling. Um, and me, as a parent even, I know sometimes my daughter's taking her medicine, and yet my brain doesn't, won't accept it, and so I still say out loud, hey, did you take her medicine? Even though I know that she actually took it. So sometimes that happens too, and this will take away some of that dynamic. Um, so we also try to find ways to link taking medicines with things that you do every day. <clears throat> so for instance, um, you know, if you plug your cell phone in every night before you go to bed, and you take morning medicines or night medicines, maybe having your pill, your pill bottles by your cell phone charger, um, just as a way to automatically link it that you can guarantee your phone's going to be charged. You can guarantee your meds right there. You can take it right away. 
Um, something like if you wash your face every morning, having you know a sticky note on the uh, mirror or your pill bottle right next to um, you know the sink. <clears throat> um, some people make their beds every day, so having your medicine next to your bed or something like that. Um, brushing your teeth, whatever it is, or things that you routinely do that you don't need to be reminded about. If you find a way to link your medicine to it, um, it'll, you'll have more success. We have some young adults where the medicine is in a completely different room and they forget about it all the time. And we're like, all right, so if you never walked into your dining room in the course of the day, then move your medicines out of your dining room and put it someplace that you have to walk by. So that way there's no chance, you know, if every morning you drink a glass of orange juice, even having your little medicine bottles in your um, kitchen cabinet by the glasses that you use for your orange juice is a good way just to visually remind yourself, oh, I need to take my medicine today. So I just try to think about ways that you, things that you do every day that might be helpful for you. And then for any teenager, um, I usually say if you have used any kind of online social media or any kind of purchasing things like iTunes or Amazon or Facebook, then you already have the skills that you need to be more independent. You just might not have used them in the same way. So as an example, um, most commercial pharmacies have an app now for phones that will allow you to just scan the barcode to refill prescriptions. Um, so instead of having to call in or type in like the 14 numbers of the prescription code, um, all you do is you just tr you get the app for like this is one for CDS where or you know you put scan a product, you take a picture on the, with your phone and it scans it and it, um, sends it in right away and it says okay, do you want to refill this prescription? Text you know Y for yes and also then it can say okay it's been you know 25 days in your 30 day medicine do you want us to refill it for you? So you can set up all those reminder things automatically for you that take away your responsibility as the person but you know relying on the technology that we all already use anyways. Um, and then the other important thing to realize about a cell phone, which most teenagers do not realize this, I think, um, is that the phone can actually be used as a telephone still. So you could technically still call a pharmacist uh, or call the pharmacy and actually talk to somebody and or enter in the prescription number to get your medication refilled. Um, so things that your parents maybe have just naturally always done for you, it's time for you to say, hey, hold on a minute, teach me how to do it or let me try doing it. Um, sometimes I even have people just you know, call in with their parent on speakerphone and that way they can hear how do I refill this prescription or how did I ask that question at the doctor's office? So other areas we want you to know about would be your history, your family's medical history, and then your information for providers and how to check into appointments. <clears throat> and so this is just a sample of when you are a new patient somewhere as an adult. You're going for a new patient appointment, for a new doctor, you get handed this uh, clipboard full of these pages and you're like, what the heck does this say? Because you have no idea. This is all about your family's medical history that you probably don't know anything about because you're a young adult, you've never had to think about it. So what we try to do is actually come up with ways for you to find out the information ahead of time um, and maybe just sit down with your parents or on the holidays or something and say, okay, so what do people in our family have a history of? Um, you know, and also not only what do people have a history of, but what have people died from? Because that's important information too. And as you're a little kid, those kinds of things aren't usually super important. But as you get older and older and you start to have more adult onset issues, it becomes more relevant probably to your medical history. With the XY variations, it's also interesting to be able to know, you know your origin and how you have that if, if it's um, identifiable for you. So good things to know. We also want people to um, know about different ways they can carry information with them. <clears throat> so these are different medical alert options or bracelets. Um, so they make paracord, diamonds, spikes, leather, beads, um, all kinds of different ways to carry information about you in case of an emergency that someone would know. And honestly, if you put XY variation <clears throat> on a bracelet, no one has any idea what that means. <clears throat> so instead, I would try to say if you have something that looks similar to autism, maybe, um, that would probably be more helpful for somebody as a first responder in kind of framing how they're going to approach you and work with you and support you as opposed to saying XY variation where they're not going to know what that means. Um, but so for medical alert options, if you have major allergies and many major medical issues, those kinds of things would be suggestions for here. Um, so they make ones that are silicone. Don't get one that has a flash drive on it like this um, because so we used to think that was going to be like the way you could carry your whole history with you and be so powerful. If you come into an ER, um, we can't use a flash drive in our systems because of the fear of viruses. So don't waste your money on that kind, actually. Just get what it actually has words written on it. And they make a million different styles. Sometimes I've worked with young adults with XY variation who um, the parents are like, that's a great idea. He or she will never wear it because they hate wearing jewelry. It's going to bother them. There's tactile defensiveness issues. Um, so just as some suggestions in those situations, they actually make temporary tattoos that you can get anything you want printed on. Um, even like an office supply store sells that paper you can put in your printer. Um, 
which is just interesting because if someone can tolerate that, then that's an option. They also make um, medical alert options that tie into shoelaces, um, so that way it wouldn't have to be touching someone's skin or bother them that way. Um, and then even things like labels and clothing. Um, so if somebody's not able to actually have something on them, um, if there was like a medical emergency and they had to do a, a trauma survey of the person's body, they would look like on their clothes and that kind of stuff to try to find some identifiable information for them. Um, so no teenager I work with, um, very few of them actually carry a wallet anymore, but they all carry their cell phones. So we talk about weight getting things like this. This is like a commuter wallet case, um, cell phone case that slides out that you can keep your ID and that kind of stuff with you. Um, if you're somebody who uses crutches, <clears throat> they make pouches for crutches. Um, you know, we do things like lanyards. Go Eagles. Um, you know, a lanyard's a really easy thing, especially college students wear lanyards because they had to have their card to access their dorms and that kind of stuff. So getting the routine of wearing a lanyard all the time. If you use a wheelchair, you could get pouches or things that go on your harness um, so that way you could access it from the front of you versus having your information in a wheelchair or in a backpack on the back of your wheelchair that you don't actually have control over. Um, another thing to know about is emergency preparedness. And so um, in your state, you should look to see if you have what's called Register Ready or Smart 911. So these are systems that um, you can register with your state that it has it that would alert first responders. Like if a phone call came from a certain phone number, it would pop up for the dispatcher. There's somebody in this household who has an allergy to shellfish and <clears throat> um, you know, uses BiPAP at night and has XY variation or what you know, you could put whatever you want on there. Um, but it's really helpful because they can also use it to, for evacuations or giving somebody more time if they know somebody in the family has medical issues um, and may not respond the way that they would typically expect someone to respond in an emergency. So if somebody called 911 and instead of thinking it was a prank call, they might say, you know what, we know somebody in this house has something similar to autism, but they don't use words to communicate effectively. We should send somebody out to check on them if, since a 911 call came from the house. Um, so that's available to anybody. You can look in your state to see if you have that available. Um, and then if you have an iPhone, um, we're wrapping up here, so we're gonna have plenty of time for questions. Um, if you have an iPhone, then every iPhone has a health app built into it. And so most people have no idea what that is. So um, the health app is little, the little red heart in a white uh, square background. And what happens is you can create a medical ID on that health app. Um, so like on my situation, on the right-hand side, you can say it says Corey, it says X, Y variation in seizures, and like my mom's cell phone number on there. And the idea is that if something happened to me, and I had my phone with me, and I couldn't communicate or I was unconscious or something, I, someone would pick me up, pick up my phone and say, oh my gosh, your phone's locked, but they could hit emergency in the bottom left corner. That takes you to the next screen that lets you call 911. But if you fill out your health app, there's a bot, see how it says a red, the red medical ID button there? They could click on that and it would take them to that next screen that actually shows what information I've put in there about myself. So that's built into every iPhone. So you could fill out your health app. If you don't have an iPhone, if you have an Android, then um, I suggest people on their lock screen either, if it's possible to have text on there with phone numbers on there, that would be important. Or somebody was suggesting even just like writing out a little list of like, you know, in case of emergency ICE, ICE, and a phone number and medical information, and then taking a picture of that and using that as your background screen for your lock phone or for your lock screen. Um, but a way that people, you know, if you had a cell phone with you all the time, that people would be able to help you in an emergency. So we say by the age of 16, we want everyone to have some form of state identification, um, a copy of their insurance cards, their emergency phone numbers and contacts, their important doctor's information and numbers, and that kind of stuff, medication and allergy lists, and then medical alert type information with them all the time. And that's just a safety thing, getting older, being out and about, not having a parent with you all the time. Um, a lot of times teenagers leave the house and don't have any information with them. And I just warned that, you know, if there was an emergency, an accident or something, you end up as a Jane Doe in the hospital. You'd rather not have that happen. So you'd rather have you have get in the routine of carrying your ID card with you and your insurance cards. It's also important because the goal is that you should start to check yourself into your own appointment. And so most teenagers I've worked with have the ability to communicate however they communicate by saying what their name is and what doctor they're there to see. Um, which is really, and then I'll give a copy of their insurance cards, which is really all you need to do in order to check into an appointment. Um, so we try to encourage, sometimes you might have to actually remind the front desk staff that, no, no, ask me, I'm, the, I'm you know, 18 or 19 years old, I can do this now, I don't need my mom's ID in the computer for me anymore. Um, so another thing. And then just to wrap this up a little bit, um, so what I just talked about is, again, very broad and generic and try to be, you know, relatively general for the entire country. Um, so these are different videos that are available on YouTube around the different topics I just talked about. And these are actually all real people 
real people with disabilities, a whole variety of different types of disabilities and pediatric onset conditions in actual programs and services. Because a lot of times I work with parents who say, well, I know there's a lot of programs out there for kids with that kind of condition, but nothing for someone like my child. And my goal is that in making these videos that I was showing the variety of different types of supports and programs out there. So for instance, on what will I do after high school, um, we had videos of people who were in um, competitive employment. We have videos of people with disabilities who are in the um, college program at the University of Delaware, which is a two-year certificate program. Uh, we have videos of people who are working in a sheltered environment. So everything to just kind of give you the broad spectrum of what's actually out there. Um, where I live also looks at the different types of residential programs. And then taking responsibility for my care is kind of, again, work on the independent living skills and the self-advocacy, self-management things. Um, legal and financial planning talks about both legal status, but also SSI um, and Medicaid and those kinds of things. And then additionally, these two other videos actually, um, so those first videos were paid for by NIMAC, the New York Mid-Atlantic Consortium on Genetic and Heritable Conditions. And then these second videos came from the Genetic Alliance, actually, um, funding from them. So one of the first one is living um, with a genetic condition, planning for your future. And then the second one is around family planning and genetics. And that's around um, the area of sexuality is something that is grossly neglected to be talked about with young adults with disabilities in general. Um, and we find, so we, with every single young adult in clinic, we talk about sex and sexuality and have you had sex ed and do you understand the mechanics and do you have questions, do you know how to protect yourself and all kinds of topics because we find that a lot of young adults who have an IEP in high school don't get offered traditional sex education classes because either people think it's not important for them or because they got pulled out for therapy during that time. So for family planning and genetics, um, so this interviews with our genetic counselors and our geneticists here talking about like, okay, this is how like inheritance patterns and those kinds of things happen. But then also in planning for your future, if you're a person, you're wondering, am I able to biologically father a child and or mother a child? How could I find that out based on my condition and who is available to me? And so um, links to information about genetic counselors, maternal fetal medicine and all those kinds of things are embedded into those videos. Um, but the family planning and the idea of sexuality is something that I think is so overlooked in the community um, that I would really, and I have a lot of resources if people have questions around kind of broaching the subject with someone who might learn things differently, um, I can send you some resources, you send me an email about that too. Um, because what we find is that hormonally, physiologically, people are people and adults, um, you know, from puberty on um, have hormonal drives just like anybody else would. And if people don't have guidance and support about how to express that, then they will seek out information that may not be accurate. Um, and we've had plenty of situations, I think we can all think of probably that we've heard of, where somebody did something that was uh, not appropriate because they didn't have any, any other things to compare it to. Um, so it's definitely a topic that gets sorely um, overlooked. And so something I would encourage you as a young adult, if you have questions to reach out, but also as parents to um, kind of get educated on how to support your young adult in that aspect of their life. Um, and there are people from a physical perspective, if, if young adults have questions about you know, like a, with a physical condition, a disability, um, about the actual mechanics of sex or something like that, there are actually um, occupational therapists in the adult world who can help young adults in that area. Um, so it's something that is an important part of identity and um, expression. And so I would really encourage people to just be open to the idea that um, everybody is a sexual human being. Um, all right, so then finally, the resources to know, the Development of Disability Agency that I talked about, Voc Rehab, Educational Advocates, Family Voices, just as a little plug for them. So they are a national grassroots organization that has a chapter in every state who um, are all, everyone who works at Family Voices is a parent of a child with a special health care need or someone who was once a child, maybe now it's being an adult, with a special health care need. So they are all parents who have been through the system over the years and know what it's like to not have any guidance or direction know what it's like to have called somebody for a resource and the person said, yeah, I'll call you back and then never had that return of phone call. Um, so I find them to be probably the best responders in actually helping parents navigate things. They help with issues around Medicaid denials and um, just offering support and connection to things that are available in your state. So a great thing to Google for your state um, and family voices. And then finally, the other one is the USED, which is the University Centers for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. Every state has them. Sometimes some states have multiple. Um, so the USEDs are really cool programs that are, um, I think, pretty innovative in almost every state around supports for people with intellectual developmental disabilities um, in independence and um, kind of transformational programs. So also something cool to look at for yourself. And then that's my 
email, which is honestly the best way to get me um, because I'm not usually at my office desk, um, but email I check pretty much 24 seven, which is probably a bad habit of mine. Um, but seriously, if you have any questions next week, you all suddenly have a trigger of something you thought about, feel free to shoot me an email anytime. And I usually am pretty good about getting back to you. Um, if I don't have a specific answer, I will at least say, here's what I would do in your situation or who's, here's who I know in your state um, to help around those issues. So I guess I will turn it back over to Robbie to see if there's a barrage of questions that have come in, I'm sure. Thanks, Corey. Boy, what a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. There, is a, there are a small number of questions right now. So let's okay. let, let me answer the very first one, which was, will we get a copy of these slides? So I want everybody to know that this webinar and all of the uh, access webinars will be on our website. Uh, this and usually within 24 to 48 hours, uh, they'll be there um, under, if you go to our library on, at the homepage uh, the, uh, and go down, scroll down to videos, and then uh, you'll see the option that says webinars. Um, okay, so let me get back to the first question for you. And this came at the very beginning of your talk when you mentioned that 10 year wait, which probably sent shockwaves through a lot of people yep. uh, for some of the services. With, uh, and the question is, with such a long wait, is this something to actually consider while a child is in middle school or high school? And the, and the listener also wanted to know, why is there such a long wait? Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. So what I usually say is um, the discussions around long-term support services, like around residential program or something like that, I think within your state agency, if your child is going to qualify for developmental disability supports of some sort like that, um, I, would, I would be registered with them ideally by probably 14. Um, just so they, what happens is they actually do like a five-year perspective with the government. Um, the legislators say, we you know we have this many 16-year-olds who in five years will be aging out of the school system with disabilities. Um, and so that's actually how they kind of come over their funding allocation typically to say we need to be able to have an option for these people when they leave the school system. Um, so that 10-year wait list has been around for a really long time. There are some places, um, I was at a conference in Toronto and the people there have a 25-year wait list for residential programs. Um, and the reason is because, again, people are surviving into adulthood at more, more commonly, but also people are living longer. And so just the adult world hasn't caught up yet to the demand. Um, I think there's lots of interesting programs going around the country trying to address issues around wait lists. Um, if you came here to Delaware, actually, and talking to our developmental disability agency, who I work with on a regular basis, they would tell you they don't actually have a wait list for services, which makes people get very excited. Um, and then they say, we have a registry, which looks like a wait list as far as an order of people, uh, you know, in a hierarchy. Um, so I would definitely say if you have intention of thinking about needing some residential supports for your young adult child, I would definitely reach out to your developmental disability agency um, in their teenage years to be able to, you know, let them know that your child exists. Um, that developmental disability agency probably isn't going to do a lot for your child right now because usually at this age, it's more the school system that's doing things. Um, but once they age out of the school system, that agency is probably who's going to be doing kind of the most supports. Um, and the earlier they know about your child, the better they're able to capture their needs. And typically the process would be that they would come out and kind of issue a score based on their level of need, um, both for that young adult, but also for, your, for yourself as a parent and caregiver. And obviously, if you are an older parent or you, let's say, have some physical needs where you're not able to physically do as much as you used to do, be able to do or something like that, that would impact the score. And it's really the highest need score is the one who gets the, you know, the first access to um, something like a residential program. Um, so the very long answer to your question is, yes, teenage years, I would definitely 11, 12, 13, 14, start talking to that agency so they know your child exists. Um, and be really active and vocal about this is what we want them to have the option of living in a supportive program. It's important for them and their development, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but sometimes it's even longer than 10 years. The same listener wrote, absolutely want to know about how they can still be part of the B uh, period of ed, even after high school. Is that board of ed they're referring to? Yes. So if they have an IEP in school, 
and they're still working towards their IEP goals. And this is where the educational advocates in your state could probably offer pretty good guidance. So if they're still working on their IEP goals, then um, there are different types of transition programs, typically called 18 to 21 year old programs. Um, and again, it's such a huge variety around the country that it look, might look very different in certain, certain areas. Um, but the idea of those 18 to 21 year old programs is to not focus so much necessarily on the academics, but more on the independent living and supports that someone's going to need to be successful as an adult. So some of those p programs um, are focused really on like learning how to navigate using a grocery store on your own and using public transportation. There are other programs that are focused on taking college classes and um, you know working on getting college credits and everything in between. So those 18 to 21 year old programs are what we usually call the transition programs, um, and that's through the Board of Ed still. Um, if your child is on track to get a high school diploma, so academically going to earn a diploma, um, then once they accept their diploma, that is basically you guys signing the contract with the Board of Ed saying, we're done receiving your services. So if your child has an IEP and still has IEP goals they're working towards, but has academically earned the diploma status, <clears throat> then you could actually set it up where they go across the stage of graduation with their peers and everyone cheers for them, yay, it's a big party for them. And what happens is they actually refuse their diploma, which they would know ahead of time, so instead of actually getting their diploma during the graduation ceremony, they'll get a fake piece of paper, which is your way of saying that we're still, we're still working with the Board of Ed and having them pay for services. Once you accept a diploma, you're saying, I'm done. So we have plenty of people who go across the stage of graduation after 12th grade, refuse their diploma, get a fake piece of paper, have three more years of services through the Department of Ed, and then after they turn 21, get their diploma in the mail. But if you send me an email, I can talk to you about what it looks like in your state and maybe who to reach out to to get more information. Thanks, Corey. The next question is, uh, the jobs my almost 12-year-old son has been placed in have been dead end. Certainly no hope of becoming independent. Are there real training programs out there, even private ones that we could look into? The training he has gotten so far has been limited to spending some time with him the first day on the job and helping with ap the application process. I'm wondering if this they meant to say 21-year-old son, not 12-year-old son. Well, I'd be really impressed if it's 12-year-old. That's really super early planning. Um, so the short answer is yes. There are some really cool innovative programs. Some are publicly funded and some are privately funded. If that person wants to email me directly and tell me what state you're in, I can tell you what I know about. But they also could go onto that thinkcollege.net website because not only do they have college programs listed, um, but they also have kind of college experience things on there too that might be around job training as well. Um, just as an example, here um, at the University of Delaware, there is a two-year program called the Classic Program, which stands for Career and Life Studies Certificate Program, which um, any, in order to be eligible, the person has to be done their traditional high school experience. So it could be 21, they could be 31, any age. Um, and it's a two-year program that's really focused on mentorship and some soft skills development, but getting to take some traditional college classes as an auditor uh, and not necessarily have to do it for grade. Um, but then also getting connected to an internship on campus, having peer mentors. <clears throat> and the students who've gone through that program, they're relatively selective in who they choose. Um, those students have either gone on to become full-time matriculated college students or gainfully employed already um, by the time they finish that program. So there's lots of different things like that that exist. I think there's 14 of them in the country. They're called TIPSIDs, TIPSIDs which are transition programs in post-secondary education for intellectual disabilities or something. Um, but if you send me an email, I can tell you about some other ideas and programs that exist. Um, what I would say is I find that a lot of the job training programs are very much this is the routine, the standard thing that we've done for everybody else, and it's easy because that's what we're used to doing. Um, but if it's not a good fit for your child or for you, then I would thoroughly encourage you to advocate and say, nope, not a good idea. And if it's through the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, they actually have their checks and balances organization um, that if you're not getting your, your service needs met by Voc Rehab, then you could um, talk to their, their checks and balances people about um, maybe having the case reassessed and reevaluated as far as meeting the needs of your child, actually. So, uh, by the way, the listener did mean to say 21, not 12. 
I thought 12, I would be really excited, but okay. <laughs> and um, this next question uh, actually might be from the same person because it says, my son was diagnosed with PDD NOS and then Asperger's before he was diagnosed with XXY. He was not, he was nine the last time he was evaluated for autism. Are there more or better resources available if he had or used the autism diagnosis? And how would one go about getting diagnosed at almost age 21? So if he's had the diagnosis, so PDD, NOS, and Asperger, now we don't actually um, classify them out individually. Now everything's just called autism spectrum. So it could be anywhere on that spectrum. So if he had, if he had the diagnosis at nine, and it was a diagnosis that was actually like legit diagnosed by a professional, then that's a diagnosis he still has. Um, so my short answer would be, I think there are definitely more services out there for people with autism than for somebody who has XY variation um, by the name itself. And so if he has that autism diagnosis, then the developmental disability agency in your state or your county would be the people who um, would probably have the most services available, um, and some states have waiver programs for adults with autism. Um, so I would definitely look into if he has that autism diagnosis and he could use that, I would look at that and see what's available to him. The way I phrase this to a lot of young adults who kind of get sick of having a label is I just explain that that label, that diagnosis, gives you access to funding that other people may not have. <clears throat> so sometimes teenagers um, or young adults are to the point where they're like, you know what, I'm so sick of this. I don't want to have people know I have this condition. And I'm like, look, if you had the diagnosis, that might mean that you get extra level of support that somebody else doesn't have that will help you out in life. So I would take that and use that to your advantage that way. Okay. Great. So let me just uh, mention to our listeners that we have about 10 more minutes here, but Corey has <laughs> graciously provided her email address. So if your question does not get asked and answered tonight, please feel free uh, to email uh, Corey. Corey told me before we came online here that she is happy to answer those questions. So uh, this listener wants to know, comments that they're thinking of retiring to another state uh, after uh, their son graduates in two years. Will the state Voc Rehab contact other states um, or, or is that something they'll need to do themselves, Corey? Uh, I would love to think that, that the other states would say, let me reach out and do this for you, but I think it's probably safer to assume that when you change states of residency, you would reach out to them individually and say, back in my other state, we had both rehab services. This is what they were providing. What does it look like in this state? What do I need to do? Um, one of the things about changing states, just in case this is another question people have, is things like I mentioned earlier, like the power of attorney, um, you could do a new one for your state. If you have a guardianship in place, um, you want to make sure also that in the state you move to, that you have somebody, an attorney there, look at the guardianship, because there are sometimes states have different types of guardianship or different levels of guardianship. And so in a state like Delaware, we have guardianship of the person or property or both. So person is like day-to-day -day decisions, property is all like financial matters, and then both is kind of the whole thing. In a state like New Jersey, they have an option for a limited guardianship. So you could say guardianship only over medical decisions. And my concern would be if somebody from New Jersey who has limited guardianship for medical conditions comes and moves to Delaware, Delaware doesn't have a limited guardianship option. So people will be honoring that as a full guardianship. And so I would just say if you have a guardianship in place and you change states, I would make sure that somebody reevaluates that to make sure it's meeting your needs the way that you expect it to. Same Thank thing you. with a special needs trust or any of that kind of thing. Great. This, this uh, listener asks uh, this question. Our son has XYY and was diagnosed last year. He's 15 and he looks like an adult, but is clearly not. What's one of the best ways to explain XYY to people and to doctors who treat him so that they can understand how to speak to him on his level? Interesting question. So I'm not the expert on all of the different types of variations. So I would actually have to look at my list of my XYY and what that. So what I would try to do to make it in the most the easier way to understand would be if it's a condition that people don't seem to know by its name, even if it has another fancy name for it, then I would try to link it to something that people more commonly understand. So for a lot of young adults we work with, they may not have a diagnosis of autism, let's say. 
but they have a lot of stereotypical behaviors that present looking like autism or something similar to autism. So I might explain to somebody that, look, yes, physiologically, he looks like a typical 15-year-old, but developmentally, he seems to understand things more around, you know, a 10-year-old level or an 8-year-old level. Um, sometimes I explain it by telling somebody, like, this is what he likes to watch on TV. This is his favorite show or favorite thing to do online. Um, just to give people a sense of kind of where somebody is developmentally to maybe um, give a sense of how to approach the topic or um, share information. We also ask everybody, how do you best learn information? So if somebody is 15 years old but can't read, that's an important thing for somebody, a new provider, to know about them. Um, and so whether they use pictures or they have, you know, kind of a kindergarten level, reading level, sight words or something like that, also an important way maybe to describe um, the, the developmental needs so that way people could probably meet him better that way. Um, yeah. Great. Corey, a listener wants to know, is there a list of states, uh, I would assume online, that offer adult disability services uh, that ranks, basically ranks the states? For example, is Minnesota better than Mississippi? Oh, that list would be a really, really, really good one to get your fingers on, wouldn't it? Um, I don't think there's one. Um, I think there are, so it's funny you say Minnesota. So Minnesota tends to be more of a uh, progressive state as far as disability things go, around dis uh, developmental disabilities. Um, so I think that there are places that are more progressive and more inclusive and open-minded about disability supports, and there are places that maybe it's not their biggest focus. Um, <clears throat> that Family Voices link that or people I was talking about earlier, they are really good um, as kind of contact people in a state. If you're thinking about maybe moving to another state and you're like, hmm, would this be a good fit for our family? I would not hesitate to reach out to Family Voices in that state and say, look, we're moving, we're thinking about moving to this area for a job. It's a great opportunity. Let me tell you about my son or daughter and tell me if you think their needs are going to get met. This is what we're used to having or not used to having. Um, because I think that definitely impacts people on, um, you know, planning for their future to know what's available or what's not available. Um, and I would just say that, you know, services for each state are changing on a regular basis. The whole idea of waivers and Medicaid waivers is a big topic right now. Um, and, you know, the idea of a sheltered workshop, I think, is falling out of favor. So I think eventually there won't be nearly as many of them in existence and more programs that are around supported employment or um, more vocational supports. So. Um, I would say just changes over time, but maybe Family Voices people would be a good ones to talk to about what goes on in each state if you're thinking about certain states. Or if you send me a note and say, do you know anything good about Texas, I can tell you what I know about Texas, too. <clears throat> Corey, what services are available for the very high-functioning young adults? Uh, the, the writer says, our daughter has an executive uh, function deficit and social-emotional challenges. Uh, I am told she doesn't qualify for anything. Yeah, and that may be true. Um, so services, it's so competitive because, again, there's such a huge demand for supports and services out there that when somebody has kind of been on that higher functioning side of things, um, they may not qualify for any kind of social services based on that alone. Um, sometimes it turns out that somebody has like executive functioning issues, is really high functioning, but also has like a visual impairment. And there might be services for visual impairment, but not because of executive functioning. So there might be something else that kind of would give her access to services. Other than that, um, I would be focusing on kind of the strategies and tools out there to help her be as independent as possible um, and what kind of um, adaptations or assistive technology can be used to help with the executive functioning issues um, in life because that's something that will impact obviously her ability to keep a job um, and relationships and all that kinds of stuff too. Uh, this writer says our son is 16 just diagnosed with ASD along with Kleinfelter, ADHD, uh, OCD. Uh, we just changed the IEP from other health impaired to autism. Was that a good idea? Uh, yeah, I think so probably. Um, Again, I would use, I would, if, if he has a sense of it and is wondering about that change in his life, um, then I would try to phrase it from the idea of like that diagnosis of autism just means that now you get access to services differently than you did before. Um, I think that people are more readily aware of autism and the different levels of support that people with autism need. So I think from an IEP perspective, 
um, the school district is probably better versed in supports for young adults with autism as opposed to other health impairment. Um, but I mean, he still has all the diagnoses, right? So it's not like he gets, he gets to drop one and get one instead. Um, so I think by having that be the primary list in the IEP, it's probably okay. Corey, the rest of the uh, questions are actually comments, uh, usually uh, saying thank you with an exclamation point. Uh, listeners have been very, very appreciative uh, and are going to follow up uh, on some of the websites that you mentioned. So uh, clearly, I'm not the only one who been, has been impressed by your presentation tonight. So cannot thank you enough, uh, Corey Nori, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And I'll remind everyone again that um, we'll have this uh, webinar up on our website, in the library, under videos, um, within a day or two, most likely. And you'll be able to listen to it as many times as you'd like. And I also want to uh, just mention that our next webinar will be uh, January 25th uh, in the new year. Uh, and this is a, a colleague of yours, uh, Corey, Dr. Adrian Dobbs, uh, promoting good health in adults with uh, XXY. Um, and that again will be January 25th at the same time as this webinar. So thank you uh, everyone for being online tonight. And once again, Corey, thank you so much. This has been a, a really, really helpful presentation. Well, thank you for so much for having me. Happy holidays, everyone. Good night.